can't seem to adapt And somebody told me That you felt the same way since we went Why wouldn't you give me a call? We'll ride on those waves again And I can wait through a storm Cause without you it wouldn't be the same One of the biggest challenges of being a real estate entrepreneur is to the past and to not live in the future. And I'm just speaking on personal experience, okay? I know that when I read all of these things on social media about what happened in 2008, it puts me in a weird spot. It really does. When I read about all the things, all the projections of what's going to happen in the future with the economy and the market and real estate investing and flipping and buying and holding properties and wholesaling properties, it puts me in a weird spot. The thing that you have to, the, the, the thing that I have to understand, not you, but the thing that I have to understand just as a real estate entrepreneur is I can only control what happens today. I can only control the quality con conversations that I'm having today, the context that I'm having today, the efforts that I'm putting in today that's going to affect what's going to happen to me in 30, 60, 90 days. Okay. And I think that that's really important. Just, and I, this is just being vulnerable. This is just from my personal experience going through being in this business since 2004 to now seeing what happened in 2008 hearing that the market's going to be crashing since 2013 i've been hearing the same story now we have some interesting um interesting things happening in our market right our buyers are looking at this chart that you see right here and they're going oh hold on right here and they are saying holy cow what is happening? The sky is falling. Interest rates are climbing. Inflation's going bananas. How are we going to go and get deals? And then on the flip side, we've got kind of this two-sided, two-faced um, uh, economy right now, real estate market right now, where the buyers are looking at the mortgage rates saying, oh, we got to tighten up. And the sellers are looking at this, right? The sellers are like, what are we talking about here? The average, the, the average interest rate, 7.77%. Like, yeah, we've been low after the recession because we had to be, but what is happening now? You know, it's not like back in the 80s or the 90s or whatever else when the interest rates were so much higher, right? So we've got buyers looking here. We've got sellers looking here, and we're caught in the middle, right? As real estate wholesalers, as real estate investors, we're trying to determine what do we do? Right? What happens? What is the next moves that we make? How do we sell our deals for the most amount of money if we are uh, assigning them or flipping them? And how do we make sure that we're buying properties that are going to cash flow uh, based on the current mortgage rates? Right? So we're in this interesting spot where buyers really want to get tighter with their numbers and sellers still expect a lot for their properties. So let's take a look at this, though. Let's take a look at what happens historically with interest rates as they rise. If you look at this chart, if you look at 1977 through 1987, look how high the interest rate. There's no way that with that high of interest rates, the, 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 
value of properties could increase, right? Well, let's just look at facts. Look at this. Look at the 1980s, the 70s and 80s. Steady increase. Why is that? Supply and demand. It's just a fact. It's supply and demand. What we need to watch for here is what is the supply of available properties on the market, okay? Now, the flip side of that is demand. Demand will reduce the higher the interest rates go up because people are going to stay in their property because they don't know if they can go into other properties. But we don't go after that market. For the most part, we're not buying owner-occupied properties. We're buying investment properties. We're buying people that we're, we're going to tired landlords. We're going to people that have vacant properties. We're going after properties that are in distress and ugly. That's why the whole name of the show is Ugly Houses, Big Checks. Stay focused on what we're at. Remember, the whole overall real estate market is much different than our niche. Our niche is going after the properties that the that that are in distress. It's the six to ten percent. So there's going to be a ton of noise in the other ninety to ninety four percent of the market. And I completely understand. And I get when you're having conversations with your cash buyers and they're telling you I need to get these properties cheaper and we'll make the adjustments. But I just want to hit you with some facts right here and help you understand that what we go after. If you focus, if you follow the map that I'm laying out here of going after ugly houses and getting big checks, you are going to win, which means you have to actually find real deals. And that's exciting because most of you guys are. I mean, no show on on uh, in real estate investing has more celebrations than this show right here on people that are succeeding in this market right now. I've gotten more texts that people are having their biggest month this month than they ever have before. Now, could it change next month? Could it change in the next 90 days? Absolutely. I think in the next 90 days, 180 days, it's going to be very turbulent because I think a lot of people that are going and locking up deals or letting the sellers really bully them or push them into higher prices because they think they can make that five, ten, fifteen thousand dollar assignment fee. That's going to be gone. We have to go after ugly houses, guys. I'm telling you, start making that that transition. If you've been going after properties that are pretty decent condition and selling it to rental portfolio buyers or you're selling it to the hedge fund buyers, they're tightening up. Make sure that you are taking that into account. Okay. Now, do I think that the sky's falling? I don't know. I don't know. What I do know is this. Based on Realtor.com, there is 516,000 properties on the market active listings, of which half of those are under contract, okay? It's 330 million Americans. There's 142 million right there, 142 million housing units. And there is 516,000 active listings, but wait, the median prices are still up year over year. What's going on there? The average days on market are down as of May. Maybe June changes. Maybe July changes. Maybe August changes. Maybe this is just the, the, the part of the hockey stick. I don't know. It doesn't matter. If you go after the ugly houses, there's always going to be opportunity there. All right? Next is this. Look at this. Look at where we're at here. Okay? This right here, 2017, was anybody complaining? 2018, 2019, was anybody like, oh, the sky is falling, the sky is falling? Guys, there were so much more. There was 1.3, 1.4 million properties on the market. Let's go, let's go uh, May of uh, 2017. There's 1.3 million properties. Right now we have 516,000. Could this steeply go up? Sure. But where are the sellers? Are they just going to just start flooding the market because they want to get the highest price? Or are people, you know, holding back because they don't want to buy something else, right? Where's the inventory going? I don't know. Nobody knows. Let's be honest. Nobody really knows. But I'm just looking at the current stats, what we can look at right now so that we can just get this. At, the whole point of the opening of the show is to get all this junk out of your head and fill it with what can I do today to find a deal? That's it. That's the whole mentality of the opening of the show is what do you have to do today to go out and find a great discounted property? Just had a text from Sammy, uh, one of my um, TTP students out of Las Vegas. She's doing business in uh, in Texas. She just locked up a deal for 115000 that the ARV conservatively is 280 I get five or ten texts like that every single day. I'm telling you, there are still incredible opportunities, and there is no inventory. Now, 
What about foreclosures? The foreclosures are going to just go bananas. People are just, you know, after after uh, they they paused uh, and put a moratorium on foreclosures, uh, it's just going to be a big tidal wave. Well, let's look at the data here. Adam Data right here has 260,000 residential properties are in pre foreclosure. The, the the foreclosure has started. 260,000 compared to uh, in 2008, when there was 2.8 million, I'm, I'm sorry, 2009, 2009, 2010, that's one tenth of the foreclosures as that time. What does that mean to me? There's less, there's a tenth less, right? I mean, there's, there's nine tenths less, right? There's, there's 10% of that amount of foreclosures right now. Does that mean that it's going to go up? I don't know. I'm just these are real stats going on right now so that we can clear out the clear out the clutter and know which strategies to go after. What I what I can tell here is and what I've read is there's 11 trillion dollars in tappable. Google this. Tappable equity in our real estate market. 11 trillion dollars. Can the market go down a little bit? Could it go down a lot and it's still not 2009, 2010? Absolutely. Is it going to go bananas? I don't know, maybe. But all these people that are putting all these posts out about 2008 or putting out posts about the predictions of the future and want to be doom and gloom and they want to warn everybody of everything, that's great. And I get it. Maybe it's coming from a place of like kindness. But to me, it's a distraction. To me, it's noise. To me, it, it affects my mindset because I'm not focused on what my business can do today to find deals. Right? I will adjust. I will adjust my numbers, but I'm still going to be le- generating opportunities every single day. That's the point of this, right? But two, 200, l- look at this, 260,000 active foreclosures. And if you go down here, he says right here, 90% of the homeowners in foreclosure have positive equity. Having equity gives financially distressed homeowners uh, uh, an opportunity for a relatively soft landing, Right? I'm just saying, guys, these are the stats. These are the facts. This is just to kind of just like woof, get it out there and just focus on the next three hours of your phone prospecting, of your door knocking, of you, you know, taking, doing your lead follow up, going on your appointments, learning how to comp properties right, learning how to do, uh, learning what an actual deal is. Those are the skills right? We talked about the 10 skills that you have to develop as a real estate entrepreneur that are absolutely critical. And this is for the first time in in at least two years, you're going to have to develop these skills. These skills are going to be so incredibly important because no longer can you just lock up anything and just sell it. It's just not going to happen. So we have to get back to the basics. We have to get back to ugly houses, big checks. Okay. And that's it. There's, there's no, there's no, you know, Whatever, if the market goes way down, if it flattens out, if there's a correction or if it's a bubble, I don't think, whatever. It doesn't matter what my opinion is. What matters is what are you going to do today that is going to affect your business so that you can keep moving forward and be a business person for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. As an entrepreneur, I mean, I would rather be in a position of an entrepreneur than an employee right now. You know what I'm saying? I'd rather be in control of my own destiny than be, you know, just waiting for something to happen with some sort of job. So if you're doing this part time, you need to double your efforts. If you're going full time, you need to stay absolutely focused on wholesaling property, wholesaling property and finding actual buyers. And if your buyers are leaving the market or they're pausing, then you need to get more buyers. Because the fact is, I have talked to the hard money lenders, and they are saying, "Listen, some people are pausing, but as many people that are pausing uh, are the as many people that are paused, other people are coming into the market, and those are the people that have been sitting on the sidelines waiting for actual deals because we've been selling them too much junk for too long, and that's a fact. So find real deals and focus on what you can focus on today, and you absolutely will win, and you can have a long term." 
business, something that is a cash machine for you for so long and you can take advantage of a market when it does go down and things are for sale and the cash flow numbers make way more sense, that's when you can go bananas. So let me hit you with two graphics here and then we're going to open up the show. I want to show you, we're going we're gonna to introduce, uh, which we should have done this a long time ago, but we've got an incredible way to really let you guys know about my man, my co-host, Rafael Cortez. Uh, he's got an incredible business. He's going to talk about that. Uh, in a video clip that we have, but let me hit you with these. Okay. Number one is this, you need to make the adjustments on your offers. Okay. Before it was 66%, 50, 25%. Now Zestimate 60%, 45 and 15. Okay. Like when you go and you look at the Zestimate of these properties, 60%, 45, 15. If it is over 250,000, hit them with 60%. If it's between 249 and 100, hit them with 45%. And if it's 100 or less, hit them with 15%. Now, listen to me. This is for traditional deals. This is not for burnt down homes. This is not for properties that are condemned that need to be knocked down. Obviously not. These are ones that can be rehabbed. And we have adjusted our rehab numbers, rehab estimates here. Now, now those numbers are what the, the max allowable offers, the 60%, the 45 and the 15 or the max that, that takes into account the actual repair costs. And there's some adjustments there in some of these major markets, the New York markets, the San Diego's, the San Francisco's, the Seattle's, the Chicago's, right? The Austin, Texas, you can get higher up. You can you, you can push that to 70%, 75 in some of those markets, right? But for the most of us, for the majority of us, that will work, okay? And then let's show, show the uh, um, rehab estimator real quick. There you go. I adjusted this by 10K on every single level. Take a picture of it. Okay. As you are running your repair numbers, that's what you're going to want to do. Okay. Now don't get confused by uh, this and the 60% and all that. If you really want to sharpen your pencil when you're really getting ready to make your offers, um, we'll talk about that, but this is your um, updated repair cost. Okay. And then the last one is this, there is a ladder of cash buyers based on the percentage of ARV that they will purchase at. Okay. And uh, throw that up right here. Cash buyer ladder. Listen to me. This is it. You need to like, this needs to be printed out in front of you at all times. Because if you look at this, this is going to show you kind of percentage where, where they're going to want to be and where you're going to make the most money based on the potential of each of the properties. At the bottom is selling it to another wholesaler because there has to be enough meat on the bone for them to sell it to somebody else. Okay, so when you're selling it to another wholesaler, you're going to get the lowest amount. Next would be the, your fix and flip. Go straight to the source, somebody that's actually going to do the fix and flip. Next is somebody that wants to do a burst strategy. They still have to have incredible equity in there for it to make sense for them to do a burst strategy. Next is people that are adding to their rental portfolio. These are people that don't need necessarily the biggest discount, but they still want to get a deal, and they still don't want to do a tremendous amount of rehab, right? So they still want a good uh, percentage of ARV in there. Um, <clears throat> next is the Airbnbs. You're going to see these are going away more and more and more. So if you're, if you're, uh, building your business based on that, it's time to pivot, uh, value add. That is when somebody finds a property that's a thousand square feet, they're going to add another thousand square feet. And now all of a sudden this house, uh, is 2000 square feet and can sell for way, 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 way more because it costs $150 a square foot to build. But it, the price per square footage in that area is like 250 or 300. Okay. Next is the owner occupied people. They're going to actually buy and live in these properties. Uh, after that is hedge fund institutional, which they are tightening up. They're tightening up. No longer can you really push it over that hundred percent ARV and they got to be pretty clean, but they're going to be their highest buyers. If you buy, get, find them in your buy box. And the last one are going to be the creative financing deals that you lock up that, you know, the lower the down payment that you have to put into that property for that creative financing deal and sell it out, wholesale it out to somebody, uh, the less money they have to come out of pocket. So they're willing to pay more because it's a cash flow play, not necessarily a price play. Okay, so this is really important with the strategies that you're going after. But if you go after, you know, ugly houses, big checks, typically you're going to sell it um, to a, uh, a wholesaler or a flipper or a burr, right? And that's the bread and butter. That's the biggest pool of buyers. We've gotten fat 
off of some of these other niche ones, the Airbnb buyers, right? The uh, the Burr strategy, the um, hedge fund buyers. So just watch watch who you're selling your properties to, okay? And just and keep adding, keep adding. If you need to know how to add cash buyers to your database, go to ttpinsider.com and get the cash buyer pack. We're putting in the link right now. Cash buyer pack, check that out, okay? Awesome. Guys, this is a participation show. We go for two hours. We've got another uh, hour and 38 minutes to go. So make sure any questions that you have, put them in the comments. If anything was unclear about this, put it in the comments. If you disagree with me on something, put it in the comments. We want to talk about this. That's the whole point of the show. But we also want to be proactive, move forward, and we want to celebrate your successes. So any successes that you've had, if you've locked up your first deal, if you've made your first check, if you closed something, even if it's not your first one, put it in the comments. Comments so people know and also make sure that you're squatting up and letting everybody where you know where, where you are doing business. Okay? Awesome. End of rant. Let's stay focused on the present. Let's stay focused on what we can handle, what we can actually control right now. Not what happened in the past, not what's going to happen in the future. Because if we pause our efforts right now because of worry, because of concern, because of all the distraction, doubt, disappointment, distraction, the three Ds, nothing happens. That's the only time that we fail is when we absolutely stop or when we don't pivot when, when the market's telling us to pivot. All right? Now, it is my pleasure and honor to show you guys this clip of Raphael and his business and what he's got going on. This is going to be – this is going to blow your mind. This is so inspiring. You guys are going to absolutely love this. Check this out. What's up, fam? Rafael Cortez here, also known as the Mexican Dude on the TTP Live show. I want to tell you guys a little bit about me, right? So I get a lot of questions regarding what my background is, what I do. I want to welcome you guys into my office and just give you a little bit of that, right? So I own multiple businesses. Uh, one of them is going to be a real estate brokerage. I own a wholesale fix and flip business. We're doing an average of 12 to 15 uh, deals a month. Uh, pretty healthy. The average revenue right now at this point is about $38,000 per deal. And I'm very, very active when it comes to the business development side of things. I'm um, an organizational psychologist as well, so I do a lot of coaching, consulting on that side for uh, just general businesses. Back in 2009, I started dabbling with fix and flips. I had a little bit of cash saved up from my previous business, uh, which was a non-emergency medical transportation business. Right? It's, a, it's a long title for a wheelchair and stretcher patient uh, uh, transport service. So I started that when I was 21 years old. Um, I was broke as hell. I bought my first vehicle at an auction. Uh, while I was trying to build that company, my car, my personal car got repoed. So I, I mean, I've seen the highs, the lows, and the uglies. Um, but I had that dream, right? I had that desire to do something bigger, to do something better with my life. The uh, degree of, of um, challenge is also the degree of growth that you have. Um, as you're going through this process, as you're struggling through the deals, as, as you're building that tenacity, right, to, to pick up the phone and make another call, as you get rejected, as you get better at objections, as you have to get better at business developments and processes, right, you grow as an individual. The real life experience and skill sets that an industry like this gives you, if you're in it for the long run, I mean, it's unmatched. I had a lot of things going on, uh, that transportation business going on, starting a family, you know, raising kids and all that. Uh, so it was just all new. I was very young at the time. To me, it took a, a while because I went, I, I feel like I went the long route, right? I had a, a few mentors and um, a lot of it was, was trial and error. So I would go back and listen to a couple of people and then implement uh, to a degree and then do what I wanted. So I, I paid a lot of dumb tax as I was going through the process. <laughs> if you're hustling to get a deal, you're taking the leap into entrepreneurship and you're starting to bend yourself. If you see yourself as a person that can be successful and you, um, you believe that, you feel it, and it's really coming from within, not from like a, a slogan or a punchline, uh, and you have this desire to get to this space, you're going to become that person. If you think you are, you're right. If you think you're not, you're also right. If you're thinking of leveling up or getting to that next you know, stage where, where you hire people and, and you start to leverage other people's talents, uh, understand that it begins with you. Now, I want to leave you with this. Hustle is a season. It's not a business strategy. We need the hustle to, to get going, to get traction, to get results in right at the beginning. But if you want to have something that's sustainable, that's something that's in for the long run, you have to shift that hustle mentality to business owner entrepreneur mentality, okay? 
Hustle is a season, it's not a business strategy. Use it as a tool, don't let it use you. I'm pretty active on social media. If somebody wants to get a hold of me, it's Rafael Cortez, CEO. Uh, you can go to uh, my website for information too on reiwholesaling.com and uh, my YouTube channel at Rafael Cortez, CEO. Stay focused, be active. Come on! Ooh. I love it. I love it. Man, the team finally made me look good. Finally, people <laughs> understand how powerful you are. I love it. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. You know, listen, hustle is a season. It's not uh, a business strategy. It's not something you can't just white knuckle this whole thing yeah. all the time because you'll get too stressed out and then yeah. you'll get distracted and then all of a sudden you're doing something else. So uh, I love it. And I love you. And I'm glad that uh, that we get to do this every single week. Bro, so. same here. Same here. Awesome. Well, let's crack this thing open, guys. Let's give, first of all, give some love for Raphael. Uh, give him, uh, I don't know, a thumbs up or a fire or something if you uh, enjoyed that. If you enjoy uh, and get a lot of value out, out of Raphael every single week being on here, uh, make sure that you give him some love. That's absolutely incredible. So let's crack this thing open. Let's see what people are thinking about and talking about in the comments section. Technical difficulty here. Here we go. I've been holding myself back for way too long thinking I can't TTP, but F that. I'm about to go TTP. <laughs> De Niro, you've been on here, brother. Like, you, you listen, you've got this. Doubt, distraction, disappointment. Those are the three things holding you back. Those are the three Ds. Or it's the perfectionism, the paralysis by analysis, or the procrastination. It's one of those, th you know, th the three Ds and the three Ps. Which one is it? Right? Which one is it that's, that's affecting you right now? And uh, if you know what it is, you know how to diagnose it. So just take, De Niro, this is what I want you to do. Just call five numbers today. Just call five numbers. I don't care where you get them from. I don't care if you just go to True People Finder and you type in any addresses around you and you just call somebody up and say, uh, and, and use the script and just say, hey, I know this is out of the blue, but I was calling to see if you would consider your off, uh, an offer on your property at boom. And if they go, I don't even own it or whatever, I don't care. Just do the action. It's reps. Listen, if you're out of shape and you walk into a gym for the first time, and I'm not trying to be a meathead like analogy here. I get it. I get it. Whatever. But you know what I mean? <laughs> but like if you're out of shape and you walk into a gym for the first time, it's intimidating. It's the way that I feel like walking onto a golf course. You know what I mean? You walk into a golf course, you see these, you know, tall guys smacking the ball a million miles, and I get up there and I'm just chunking out, you know, chunks of this thing and embarrassing myself, and the ball's going five feet, and it's just, you know, silly, like some sort of TikTok video. You know what I mean? But then you start doing it and getting good, and then just start practicing, and then you get somebody to help you, and then your friend's helping you, and your dad's helping you, everybody's helping you, and you got support, and you got all these people saying, do this, do this, do this. All of a sudden, over reps, you start getting better. It's like, anything but change is hard but De Niro I'm I, listen I'm pumped for you brother go for it go for it just just take and this is for everybody this isn't just De Niro there's plenty of people De Niro on here that are that are afraid to really get started right and to really just start building this momentum and the number one thing that I get when people join my coaching program is listen Brent I've been watching you for a year two years three years I've been listening to the podcast forever I've been doing all this thing and I finally made the decision that something needs to change so, and then boom, all of a sudden, action, 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 support, community, all of these things. You've got it here. You've got it with whatever, you know, if, if you want to find a local mentor or a meetup group or somebody that you combine with or join a coaching program or whatever it is, or just do it yourself or, or, or better yet, never do it yourself. Just find somebody that you can get on some sort of like Google meetup, um, Google hangout online, whether they be anywhere and just have it live. You making calls, them making calls. You can mute the whole thing. And then when you do make a good call to be like, oh, my gosh, I got a lead. And you see somebody else and they're like, oh, my gosh, I got to get one, too. Now you can have fun with this. People like go on Twitch all the time and they're playing video games and recording video games and they're talking the whole time and they're fine with that, right? It's the same thing, but you can make a fortune doing this. So do it. Congratulations. I love it. I support you 100%. Get it going and watch. He's going to come in like, you know, a couple weeks. Be like, I got this deal. A few weeks, whatever. 
The Brent, are you still? Yeah, Brian, great question there. So the 0.83 is moving back. Yeah, yeah, I would move that back. 0.75 minus repairs um, might be a little bit too much in a lot of the in in a lot of the major markets. I would probably go to 0.8. And what he's talking about, real quick, for everybody is and and, and real quick for anybody that's just getting started, uh, just use this the the um, Matt. Um, <laughs> Aaron, will you please put on the, the chart again? Yeah, just use this for now. 60, 45, 15. Um, and and that'll, that'll really serve you well moving forward as a basis. And what you do is you use this and you have a conversation with the property owner and you say, hey, listen, uh, it looks like, and you could do this, this isn't you just in fantasy world making stuff up. You will find properties within a mile radius of every single property that I'm talking to that has sold at 60, 45, 15% in every market across the country. Okay? Um, maybe not Manhattan, but whatever, or Miami. But... Uh, you can, you will find uh, that there are, there are properties, and you say, listen, it looks like uh, neighbors similar to yours in the area are selling for boom, sixty percent, forty five, fifteen percent, and then you want to pull out their number, and then what you want to do is you really want to sharpen your pencil. I mean, Zillow's great, but just make sure that you have somebody double check your numbers because estimates are it's an algorithm. It's it's just ones and zeros they're just pulling data from around the area and just trying to make sure that it jams into what the value is so you want to do you want to get a prop stream right or a batch leads you want ttpdata.com or you want um, batchleads.io um to really look at okay where are what in this area in the specific neighborhood what are things selling for and come up with a strong ARV and if you're not comfortable with that squat up squat up when your first one two three four deals five deals whatever it is with somebody that really knows numbers in your market so you know what price is the true ARV in this market and then what you'll find is uh, ARV times 0.8 Minus repairs is the wholesale price. And then you want to subtract your assignment fee. Guys, this has been 0.84 for the last six years. Now it's 0.8. Right? Knock off about 4% right now. And that's just because... Um, that's because of the news. That's because of social media. That's because investors are looking at interest rates climbing, and it's been really easy to fit deals in and make it make sense with the current interest rates, and that's gone up. So um, make the adjustment, and, and you will win. You will win big time. All right? <clears throat> Hey Brent, I want to. I just want to shine some light on this. Right? Yeah. It, it's that's why it's so important to stay on top of the uh, the trends as they're coming in. Yep. This is a, like, what we do in wholesale. It's pretty dynamic, you know, meaning that it changes fast, right? I mean, we see a spike and then it boom. I mean, it throws off the whole business model. Um, so when you guys when you guys are out there uh, doing your comps and then just understanding how the market is working in, in your area and whatnot um, ask yourself the question okay is this still relevant or am I using stuff that was useful six months ago right right just you know that active learning look process. at the pending yeah. deals days on market type days of stuff. on yeah. market look at the pending deals before we've been looking at solds the solds tell us about our past right the actives right now are not telling us <clears throat> what's happening because the actives you're gonna see in some markets, you're getting 50% of the listings on the market are reducing. Well, yeah. of course, if they got what they wanted, they'd be pending. They wouldn't be yeah. active. These stats are ridiculous. What is it? 68% of stats are made up? It's insane, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, 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 stop. Like, what is actually happening? Talk to your buyers. Talk to the people that are out there actually buying and having, you know, still have businesses built up doing this, right? Find anybody that is a part of Collective Genius in your market, for real. Find anybody that's a part of Collective Genius. It's the top, top, top mastermind for, for real estate investors around the country i couldn't i mean i have some of the greatest friends are in that group and they really understand strategy they really understand what to do and they're all connected like a like a hive mind brain type of thing find them and ask them what are you buying what's happening right now what should i be going after and i want to target my efforts towards that for real 
I mean, that's 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 how you get the real stats. But as you're doing your comps, you want to look at pending listings on the market as you're doing your own research. I'm switching tracks quick here. Uh, pending listings on the market are going to tell you kind of what's going on. Once that price hits that point, um, and then what is that going to sell for? Typically, they're selling for around what it's listed at. If you look at the stats here, um, in it, well, you can look up in realtor.com. You can go into their stats section in your market and see what is the price per listing. In Arizona right now, it's 103% of list price is the average sold price. Still, lack of inventory. That could change. I don't care. It doesn't matter. We go after ugly houses. We just sold a property yesterday for, uh, we bought it for 330. We sold it for 410. We'll net 70 on it. Great. It's a great, it's a, it's a solid week and we keep moving on, right? Like there's still deals out there. Just make sure they're real deals. All right. Congratulations, Mendel. He has a six unit under contract for 275 looking for 300 TTP. Let's go get as loud as possible. I want it sold by the end of the show. Get it done. Here we go. Mendel, that's great. Oh, yeah. I love that. Um, yeah, get it sold. Awesome. Huh? Yes, guys, uh, hit that like button. If you can value out of this, make sure that you hit the like button. It helps with the YouTube algorithm, which brings more people into our world, which means that there's more opportunity for a really strong community here in the comment section. I'm not in the comment section. Kenny's in the comment section on some level. Alejandra's in the comment section on some level. But it's not like us like, oh, here, we're going to sell you a bunch of stuff. Just get in there and connect with everybody in there and squad up. That's the most important thing, especially in this. So if you're getting value, hit that like button. It helps us out, and uh, I really, really, really appreciate that. Uh, John Johnson, do you have to disclose how much you're making on an assignment agreement, LOL? Um, there are assignment agreements where you don't. Um, there are assignment agreements where you can. Do you, do you put how much you're making? We uh, The verbiage we use is the difference between the purchase price and then the sales price. Right. So we don't have an exact amount. Uh, it depends on but the they type know. of company. They're, they're going to see the purchase contract. Yeah, I mean, point. they're going to find out. They're going to see it at the end of the day. Like you're, you're not going to be able to hide the assignment agreement, right? Yep. Um, but John, if uh, it's really going to de uh, depending on the title company that you're using, they're going to ask you to disclose the amount, or then just do a, a, a verbiage that says the assignment, you know, of this property or this transaction is going to be the difference between the purchase price and the sales price, and then the parties. Um, so if you're worried yeah. about it with the buyer, John, that's a great way to get the assignment done without them knowing off the bat how much. Can you switch the camera, please? Uh, thank you. Uh, how much they are, uh, how much you're making on it. If you're if you're a little bit nervous with your cash buyer, um, if you're really nervous, you can certainly do a double close or a double escrow, um, and and just be make two purchase contracts. Right, you. A double close, double escrow, and if anybody wants me to walk through that, let me know. Um, that that will uh, make it so nobody knows what you're making there, but you do have to close on those properties, so it makes it a little bit different. It's a little bit different with capital gains tax because technically you took ownership, so it's a whole different thing with your CPA that you're going to have to let them know about. But um, it, and and if you don't want the seller to know, then you can have a conversation with your title company or closing attorney to do what's called a blind HUD, where they just see their side and they don't see the buyer's side uh, they'll just see their statement with what how much they're going to net and they're not going to see what the costs are on the buyer side now i've never had a problem with a seller going oh my gosh what's this assignment fee uh this this buyer is paying you money for this property I've never had a problem with that. Maybe I will in the future, but it's never happened. And so um, I don't do blind HUDs. I just go straight at it. But some companies do, and some people, some companies prefer that. So um, that's an option as well. Yeah, but I would, I would investigate the seed of the fear there, John. If you're thinking that your cash buyers um, are going to get are, are going to start getting this is interesting actually. As we're going through it, it might be good to start. Um, <clears throat> protecting how much we're making from the cash buyers because cash buyers are squeezing. Yeah, cash buyers are squeezing right now, and if they see how much you're making, they might want to squeeze you, especially if you're new. Um, I'm going to investigate this. I'm going to do some research, and I'm going to see if this this is a strategy that I'm going to start talking about a bunch. Great, great uh, way to bring it up, John. 
You always have great stuff. And guys, if you have not joined uh, John Johnson's uh, Discord, it is a phenomenal group. People in there are just wildly enthusiastic about this business. They are just absolutely incredible. So make sure you check that out, John. I don't know if there's a link or something that you can put in here or how they find it. I, I, I'm getting educated on Discord, but, you know, I'm like a... What, are, what what am I? Generation X or Generation Y? Yeah, generation I think something? I think we're out of that bucket. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like it's like oh, you, it, it's hidden or whatever. I don't know what that means. Assigning my first fo- eight plex today. Come on, oh. assigning my first eight plex for thirty thousand dollars today. TTP forever, John Johnson. Ooh. Here we go. Come on. Mind you, mind you, he's in Argentina too. Yeah, and he's yeah. Uh, doing it virtually from Argentina, guys. <clears throat> um, so. No excuses. Listen, this thing right here, and I, I say this time and time and time again, this is your portal. This is your portal to millions of dollars. This is this is the fact that this thing, this thing and this microphone right here, this power right here, um, it is it, it's a portal. It's like all of a sudden you can use that from anywhere in the world and uh, make incredible income, make thirty thousand dollars on a multifamily uh, in Argentina. Incredible. Uh, Freddie H. Brent, do you see rehabbers buying teardowns in neighborhoods where the new builds are over the median sales price? Yeah. Yeah, Freddie. It just depends. Listen, good areas right now. Here, here's here's what's going to get hit first. The, the outskirts, the smaller markets out there where there's not a tremendous amount of cash buyers, all those cash buyers talk to each other. All of them start getting a little bit grumblings about what's going on and how much wholesalers have been making and all these other things. So they're going to tighten the most first. In town, where people, where it's very desirable, good school districts, good areas, bigger cities, bigger towns, bigger, you know, uh, more economy in the area. That's where there's there has to be there, those are where there has to be the most deals because that's where the most people are going to be. And there's still going to be supply and demand and people are still going to make enough to be in there. Now, if the job markets go bananas, if unemployment goes through the roof, if everything goes, you know, uh, crazy, then there's going to be, you're definitely going to want to be in major cities, right? The, the outskirts is going to be really rough. Uh, for our business. So just make sure you understand that and make sure that you're keeping an eye on uh, on unemployment rate in your areas. Okay? Good question, uh, Freddie. <clears throat> one thing that that's happening too that we just did, uh, I just put two VAs prospecting specifically for buyers. Yeah. So we're tackling the same way that we uh, that we tackle seller leads. Yep. Um, we're, we're, we're going after buyer uh, campaigns to build that uh, list out some more. And it's a big list. But again, you have different. You have a different breed of buyers uh, that that we're you know we need to tap into right now. It's yeah. just yeah, that is what it is. So. Yeah, hundred percent. Isaac, I am doing this part time. I want to quit my nine to five and do this full time. Good. Mm. Do it when you have at least six months of expenses, business and personal, saved up in an account. I'm serious. Like you do not want to go. I'm out of this. I'm doing this full time. And then you're like, "Ah, I've got like six weeks, eight weeks before, you know, I got to make something happen. And then you've got all that stress, all that pressure, and you're focusing on that pressure and you're not taking the action. You can still get this thing going, but it's a lot easier to do this business when you don't have a clouded mindset of a ton of pressure because you're about to run out of money. Okay. If you take money off this uh, to the side and you're like, okay, I'm comfortable. I can live for a while. I can live for six months here. No problem. I can dedicate myself here. Then you're not constantly putting your attention on your bank account, right? You're putting your attention on ugly houses, big checks. And when you put your, everybody on here, if you put your attention on ugly houses, big checks, you will win. Just telling you. But if it's all over the place, yeah. Best way to find buyers. Um, well, uh, Ref, what are your VAs calling right now? Um, they're actually we're doing um, uh, direct ma- uh, messaging campaigns. So we're actually DMs. hitting, yeah, we're doing DMs. We're hitting people in Facebook groups uh, and stuff like that. So they're they're scraping through existing Facebook groups, and looking at finding people that are buying. Yeah, and they're sending, yeah, they're sending out direct messages, and we're just pulling a buyers list from that and compiling, um, and it's working. I mean, our buyers list is increasing, and and we've been able to move properties that way through the new lists. Um, and I've been doing that for last month, month or so, about yep. four or five weeks. Yep. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's it's basically we're going through it. We're scraping those lists. These buyers are out there, and we're just 
mm, we used to do it just on a property basis, all right? So, okay, we have a property that we haven't been able to move. Now we're going to tap into this. Uh, but we're doing it intentionally, and we're treating it like a seller's uh, campaign. So Love that's it. that's a big difference there. Yeah, I would go, if we can put go to my uh, computer here. <clears throat> Um, I don't know why it's being real slow. Is our Wi-Fi super slow right now? Um, I would go to Zillow and I would look for any of these properties that look like they're flipped and staged. Um, let me see if this one is. This looks like it is owner occupied. Uh, I would look for any flip properties, and I was going to do a keyword search. Sorry, guys, for uh, remodeled or renovation, um, and for some reason it's not letting me go to. Okay, there we go. Keywords. Let's go remodeled. Done. And hopefully this will pull up. And we look for some of these properties that hopefully have been um, flipped. They've been totally staged. You can tell that they're staged because there's nothing in the house. Right? This one looks like it's probably an owner-occupied based on the baby stuff like this. I wouldn't call this agent. This is just a traditional agent. I'd look for properties that were uh, flip properties. And then you call up the agent um, once they're, this looks like it's probably, nope, this one's still people living in it. See, this is the telltale right here is where you see all these, uh, you know, all the stuff in the closets. So I'd look for a property that looks vacant, but staged and uh, looks unbelievable. And uh, let's see if this one, uh, and then I call them up. Yeah, something like this, right? It looks beautiful. It's it's going. And then you don't want to call this person. Uh, you you want to you want to call this person. Sorry, the listed by, and just Google this person and where their uh, their real estate brokerage. Find their phone number. Call them up and say, Hey, listen, I see that you've got this great listing on Alameda. Um, I see that it's it's a flip property. Are you looking for other properties in that area? And that's how you start building that up and start finding those agents that represent the flippers. Okay, and they are hungry. They are so hungry. So make sure that you go after those properties. Okay, and then just do that over and over and over and over and over again. All right, on Zillow or Redfin or, or Realtor.com doesn't matter. There you go. Two-part. Two-part question. Here we go. Teresa, I've noticed I'm speaking to a good amount of investor landlords. They get right into it and ask for an offer price. I ask about the condition of the property, and they just say to send them a offer price. How could I possibly send them without the condition? Should I just go straight to the comps and present them with what I have? Yeah, Teresa, that is a wonderful question. How can you? That's how you go, okay, I would love to send you an offer price. Um, can you tell me? about the condition of the property, because obviously that affects value. You're an investor. You understand that, of course, right? Appeal to their driverness, to appeal to their you know ego that they know everything and they understand everything. But for the most part, I will tell you just instinct and from not even instinct, but from experience, uh, the people that say stuff like that typically are not going to sell to you at a discount. Right, they're just they're just stiff arming you. They want you to see if that you're going to give them one of those hedge fund buyer prices and that they've heard about from their buddies or from at a barbecue or on the golf course or whatever else. And they're just like, um, you know, yeah, send me, you know, tell me how much you'd offer me. So you can hit them quick with the sixty percent, the forty five or the fifteen, and then just go on. And if they won't, if they're like, no, you, I'm not telling you the condition of the property. You just give me a price. <clears throat> Be like, I, I can't I can't in good conscience give you a price on this property. I don't I don't want to give you a price without knowing what the property needs. Right? Can I ask a question on that? Yeah. Could you do it with Kenny's asking the, the question. He's asking. Could we do it to where it's like contingent upon XYZ checking out? Contingent on the inspection of the yeah, property, you can contingent. Go to yeah. Areas? Yeah, you can. Kind of going in blind, but the the issue that you have, if you go and you go, okay, I can give you an offer contingent on the, the condition of the property. Um, the likelihood that they're going to take your offer is very low. You know what I'm saying? Because they haven't they haven't told you their problem. They haven't told you the condition. They haven't told you if they, their timeline. The number one thing that you want to find is timeline. So, Teresa, okay, the condition is very important. Well, I don't want to give you the condition. Just give me the price. And go, okay, great. If I gave you the right price and it made sense, we can close in 30 days. Are you ready to close in 30 days? If they say yes... Interesting. They have a timeline. They're, they're thinking about selling. There might be something there. If they go, oh, I don't know. 
I was just, <laughs> I was just wondering uh, what uh, somebody would offer me. You know what I mean? I get a lot of these calls, and I just, uh, you know, sometimes I mess with people, and sometimes I, you know, just want to know what's going on in the market and blah blah blah. Right? We've all had these conversations. If you've talked to a thousand property owners, which I suggest everybody do, this is like the hardest thing. Uh, that I ask people to do is talk to a thousand property owners before you hire anybody else to make calls for you. Okay. Because you're going to understand how to react. You're going to understand what's a good list. You're going to understand, you know, what's going on in your actual marketplace. People want to hire VA D day one for $4 an hour. It's, it's rough. I mean, maybe you can get a deal. And the worst part is when you do get a deal from that VA like two weeks into it and then you pour money, all that profits that you made into it back into that VA and don't do any more deals. You know what I mean? So there um, you go. What, what do you think about ranges? For example, we'll do a range. And this is kind of like a pre-qualifier, but it, it's part of the standards uh, you know, process yep. that we have. Yep. We'll do a range from 65 to 80 yep. percent depending on the condition. Uh, and it's more of a qualifier. Are you guys doing any of, the, any of that stuff? No, because I I don't give a I mean I would have to talk to Ryan. I think I think when when Ryan sinks his teeth into mm -hmm. it, like when it's a real real close deal, we'll give him a range until we see the property. Yeah, just 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 to get a ballpark because maybe we can go up. Yeah. you know what I mean, depending on some of the conditions. So they'll do it when it's when we're further down the line. When we have more of the four pillars of pre qualifying, we will. But if it's just initial conversation and somebody's like, how much will you give me? And you're like, well, you know, uh, the condition's important. They're like, no, 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 just tell me how much you'll give me. And you're throwing out that, well, your neighbors are selling. I like using the neighbors. Yeah. The neighbors are selling for this amount. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Because yeah. it's not like I can give you this between me and you. This is like, this is what I'm seeing in your marketplace. Tell me what you think. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's more open-ended, I think, than just closing the door of, uh, I could give you one fifteen. You know what I mean? Yeah. Your neighbors are selling for around one hundred and fifteen thousand in similar size and condition. Does that work? Right? <clears throat> yeah. There you go. What can you do today to get a deal? Who's going to sign a contract today? Who's going to sign the agreement today? That is the question that should be on all of our minds. And I'm telling you, I don't know if you're like, like my whole life, all of Facebook, all of Instagram is filled with real estate investors and incredible people in this community. And some people that have a ton of property, some people just getting into it. And it's like, there's a lot of like this living in the past and living in the future going on. And I'm sitting there like, man, this is crazy. And then you got Logan Hill here. Get that bell ready. First ever offer I made on the MLS got accepted, even though there were other offers above mine. I got accepted because I was on the phone with the realtor. TTP pays. Congratulations, Logan. Now get it sold. You're halfway there. Get it sold. Let's ring that bell for Logan. Here we go. Listen, people are sleeping. And listen, if you're getting stuff off the MLS right now and you're putting it in front of your investors, it better be at a discount. It better not be at list price or around list price or whatever else. Even if there's some, unless it's a really hot market, I assume, because there's uh, several offers above yours on there. But because you built a relationship, there's room there that you can get this thing sold if it's a really hot market that works in really hot markets. If you're in a market that's not as hot, that has a little bit more inventory, um, then you need to get it way under the MLS. But if you're in a place where, you know, people are still, a property goes up and it sells in like 24 hours, um, you can get close to the MLS price, but that'll start decreasing, guys, like really start getting good at negotiating but congratulations logan what a smile looking good love the hair that's awesome uh jose brent curious why do you say pivot for airbnb um look at what happened in atlanta right um, a couple different things. So one is so now atlanta won't allow outside investors to own airbnbs and correct me if I'm wrong, this is just what I've read. Uh, maybe like ac people in the actual market can give me a better perspective of it. You usually can. Usually I'm off by like 10% on some of these things when it comes to other markets and 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 you know what what they're requiring from a real estate standpoint. But um yeah, you 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 can only own two and you have to be a local buyer, uh you have to be a local resident, right? You're gonna see a tightening up, Jose, of and this has been happening for a long time, the hotel and resort lobbyists are trying to destroy Airbnbs. 
Because obviously it affects their 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 market share. It affects you know how many people are going into these places, right? And so some places there's a surplus, but as soon as that starts tightening, as soon as the economics, as soon as gas prices and food prices and all of this inflation starts tightening people's budgets, and they're not going on as many you know staycations and vacations and going to other places and traveling as much. Those resorts and those hotels have uh, so much money behind them to lobby the local Congress, the local policymakers to say, hey, listen, you got to slow down this, this vacation rentals. Not only that, but you've got neighborhoods that are like, are you kidding me? Every every night is a party in my next door neighbor because it's a it, it's a it's um uh, an Airbnb or a short term rental and it's driving us crazy. It's not good. They're parking a bunch. They're driving. They're disrespectful. All this stuff. So a lot of like communities are getting behind it. A lot of this. So I would just say, really watch what are the policymakers in your state doing about short term rentals and whether or not they're going to require people to have a license and if they're only going to give a certain amount of golden tickets out. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. So that's why I say Airbnb. The second reason, Jose, is just the economics. It's just this right here. If you look here, the uh, it was a lot easier. It was a lot easier to buy properties and get a nice payment on them and a nice return when uh, interest rates are down here. And as they start creeping up, it starts eating into the profit. Now, listen, some Airbnbs are just absolute cash cows, right? Just absolute cash cows. Um, but... Uh, it's it's going to start reducing, and so you need to give them better discounts on it. It's still a really solid strategy if you're in a market where they're allowing short-term rentals and there's no real restrictions there and you can do it, and the numbers make sense. But just make sure that um, the economics make sense with the price that you're trying to sell these at. That's it. I just see less. I just, it, the, Jose, from my perspective, we were selling a lot to people in Scottsdale and Tempe and Phoenix that were doing Airbnbs and having conversations with those buyers. And my disposition manager, Jeremy, having conversations with those buyers are saying, mm, I'm going to hold off for a bit. Remember, people that aren't doing fix and flip and building fix and flip businesses and are just doing Airbnb and rental type things, they're okay to just sit on the sidelines. Because they have other jobs or they're living off of the cash flow from this and keeping their lifestyle nice and tight. It's nice. It's a nice strategy. But people that are constantly building, you know, doing fix and flips, they got to keep doing fix and flips or their crew's gone or they have no income or they have to live off of savings. And if you know anything about most fix and flippers around the country is they like to ball out a little bit. They like buying big houses themselves. They like having boats and vacation rentals and all these other things. You know what I mean? So um, they got to keep they got to keep the ball rolling as well. All right. Land is being smart. The local government is in good with the local investors. So they both benefit off each other. Airbnb is good, just not for outside investors. Exactly. Exactly. So all the outside investors that were surrounding um, the area that were buying properties, uh, Airbnbs in Atlanta, aren't going to be able to do so. So make the pivot to selling to the local ones and not the people that are buying from out of state. Uh, Isaac, I just got my first contract signed a couple of days ago to close escrow Monday. You're going to close de this deal in, what, nine days? That's bananas. Get it, Isaac. Hey, Isaac, let us know how much you're making. Look at this thing just creeping down a little bit like, a, like it's a ghost. That's hilarious. Uh, congratulations. Let's ring that bell. Here we go. I'm telling you, with all of the distraction that is out there with the media and social media and, and real stuff, guys, this is real life. Interest rates are going up. inflation's going up. All of this stuff is real life, but we can only control what we can do today. All right? Don't live in the past. Don't live in the future. Live in what you can do today. Go after ugly houses, big checks. I'm going to be, I am going to be pounding that drum for the next six months. I'm telling you, I think for the next 90 days to 180 days, and I've been telling this to my company, I've been telling to all my coaching students, for the next 90 day to 180 days, there's going to be turbulence. Make sure you lock up deals lower. Just make sure you lock up deals lower. And if you need to, show this. Put it, put it back on the computer here. Show this graph to your sellers. Be like, this is what's going on. This is why the I can't give you that price. 
is because the interest rates going up, inflation's going up, cost of fixing, uh, the cost of materials is going up, cost of labor is going up. Because of that, it doesn't make financial sense for me to give you 250000 I need to get this at 215000 That's the pivots that you make. You can use this to your advantage. I doubt that they're going to whip this one out and be like, oh, really? Oh, really? Look at this. It's historic lows. It's, it's creeping back up, but it's, uh, you know, the 7.77 was the average since 1971. Well, yeah, when you have a 19% interest rate in the 80s, it's going to creep up. It feels weird. I get it. It feels weird. I've been in this business a long time. I've been in it since 2004, and you can see it's been under that market, the, uh, under that average the whole time. So I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that this is real life. This is what prices have done since 1960. You know what I mean? So there's still people buying. There's still, there's still not only that, but um, the, the values have increased over that time. You see that dip right there, right here in the, uh, you know, after the, the, the greatest recession. The greatest recession of all time went from 322,000 to 259. The greatest recession since 1929 went from uh, 322 to 257. It's a big dip. Brent, where can they find this graph? Where did you find this graph? Google. Uh, this one right here, just average sale. Uh, I'll put all the, it's in my email. Just put all the links in it. We'll put all the links in. Uh, do you want the chat or the show notes? Okay, we'll put it all in the show. Listen, it's all in my email. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I'll 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 put it in the uh, I'll put it in the uh, the comment section. There you go. Good. It's going up. I mean, the 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 prices have taken a huge increase. I'm telling you, I bought a property, and I said this before. I bought a property in 2019 for 380 thousand in Scottsdale from Jesse Burrell when they were doing their wholesaling thing. Uh, an Airbnb just sold for 920. Model match. That's bananas, guys. That's that's just bananas. I don't think that that's real. And listen to me right now. If you've had a ton of equity built into your property, do not go get a home equity line. Do not pull out your equity in your properties. I am telling you, this isn't the time. Don't do it. Don't. Do, I mean, do what you want. I mean, I'm not going to give you uh, financial advice in that sense, but um, I am not going to do that. There you go. I used to be a killer. Been out of the game for maybe two years. Basically, I have no confidence. I have like 90K to play with. Where do you think I should start first? I primarily use mailers. Well, if you know mailers and you have a system for mailers, start with mailers. Right. And just start getting out there and start testing it and seeing if you're getting really good returns. At a minimum, you want a one to four. Right. Or a four to one. You, you get four dollars for every one dollar that you spend. That's a nice, healthy marketing budget. OK, uh, if you can get more than that, that's when things really start getting exciting. So you can start testing that out. I would also just drive, find the ugliest properties, skip trace their numbers, call them, text them and uh, and send them a handwritten note. And uh, if you if you find the thousand most ugly properties in your marketplace and be obsessed with them, you should do 20 of those deals a year, if not more. So you don't have to have like this huge thing, but you you got to be really, really, really specific about going after the ugliest properties, especially right now. <clears throat> My question would be why why did it fall off the game two years ago, and mm -hmm. and, and what uh, took a hit on the confidence? I mean, those conversations need to that needs to be built back up before before any any real talks on negotiation like bubble up. Surrounding yourself with yeah. super positive people, super proactive people, you know, people that are going to cheerlead you and support you. And, and if you're out there and you're kind and optimistic, which I know you are, Novice Wanderer, then you're going to find kind and optimistic people. And in these uh, times of uncertainty where everybody's looking into the past and into the future, you need to have kind and optimistic people around you. Because the fact is, it doesn't change the fact that we have to talk to people. If we have a good market or we have a really terrible market, the fact is you still have to have quality conversations. You still have to talk to people. 
That's the fundamentals. Go back to the fundamentals. It's been fun the last couple of years, just messing around. The last four years really has been pretty wild with the different marketing channels and techniques and, and all of these different ways that people are going about finding opportunities. Um, but it, it's going to be just get back to the basics. See an ugly house. Talk to the property owner. Build a rapport. Build relationships. Build some respect there. And you'll, you'll get those deals. <clears throat> so there you go. Are bank-owned properties worth going after? No, Tammy. Nope. nope. So what happens is, uh, let me kind of di diagram this. So um, just so everybody knows, when you run across it, if you're just getting into real estate, there's a terminology that you'll see pop up uh, time and time again, and that's R-E-O, and that stands for real estate owned. That means that the bank owns these properties. Now, what happens? What happened in the downturn is uh, people would, uh, real estate agents would get these listings, right? The banks don't. The, the, the banks don't want to list these properties. They don't want to own these properties, right? So they want to get rid of them from a third party as quick as possible. So they found agents that they trusted in the market. But what happened is the agents would go, okay, this property is worth. Uh, you know, 70,000, and then all of a sudden their brother-in-law came in and offered 20,000. They go, yeah, we got an offer for 20,000. Let's take it. Uh, they didn't have a tremendous amount of oversight. People were selling kind of insider trading type thing, unfortunately. And so what the banks did is they go, okay, listen, we're going to do an independent third party, and they're going to do something called a BPO. That's called a broker price opinion. That means that a different agent is going to price this property than the one that listed. They're going to go and get two different uh, evaluations on that property, and that's the list price. And for the first 30 days or so, 30 days, they will only accept offers within 98% of this. And then after another 30 days, if it doesn't sell, they'll accept an offer of 90% of this. So if you go in and you go, okay, well, this property's listed at 70,000, there's no offers, I'm gonna offer them 20,000, uh, the bank will not accept it. They'll just keep it on the market until the timeline ticks down low enough to where they would take that offer. So by the time that that happens, uh, Tammy, um, by the time that they lower that price all the way down, typically that's when multiple offers are going to come in and uh, they're going to get accepted and you're going to have a lot of competition. So they, they cannot typically, if it's a bigger bank, typically they're not allowed to sell it uh, underneath a certain percentage uh, until it's a certain amount of time on the market. Does that make sense? Was that clear? Yeah. Yeah? Does that make sense? That's okay. Yeah. Okay. That didn't make sense to you, Kenny? Okay. If that didn't make sense to you guys, let me know. No, but he was fixing the camera. I was fixing the camera. Oh, okay. He wasn't listening. I was, but okay. Kenny's always busting balls. One job. <laughs> one, one job, job. Kenny. You got one job. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there you go. Are the days of 40K plus wholesale spreads gone? Not no. if you know how to negotiate. Not at all. Yeah, Fogtown King. Um, <laughs> and, and remember, it depends on what price points you're going after. I mean, typically you're getting 10% of the deal. So if you're going after $400,000 properties, boom, you're in that sweet spot. But if you're trying to get a 40K deal out of a deal that, you know, will ARV at 150,000, it's going to be a lot tougher. That's why I want to push people into higher price points. Um, because you, you, you typically get more for those deals, but listen, if you're in a small, if, if you're in a, um, a uh, an area where the prices aren't as high, you're going to do more deals. That's the beautiful thing about it. It all evens out. If you look at the top real estate investors around the country, you'll see that some of them are in smaller markets. Some of them are in less expensive markets. Some of them are in San Francisco, right? Some of them are in Miami. You know, some of these high, high, high price points. Um they're all over the place because it all evens out. You either do less deals for more spread or more deals for less spread. There you go. But no, the days of 40, I, I, I literally, yesterday we assigned one. Um, well, technically it's a flip because we closed on it, but uh, for uh, 80,000 after expenses and everything, we didn't put it on the market. We sold it to our cash buyer database, but uh, after the expenses, we'll probably net 70,000 on it. 
So still incredible deals. Uh, you just have to be um, just be consistent and go after and get them at lower prices. All right. And listen, there's going to be so many sellers. I'm telling you, this is just the feedback I'm getting from my coaching students. There's going to be so many property owners that all of a sudden you're going to start getting texts from. All of a sudden they're going to start reaching out. Right, Raph? I mean, they just all of a sudden all of these sellers are starting to go, oh, boy. They're getting the memo. Oh, boy. <laughs> Uh, things are going to crash. Things are going to go down. It's all going to be terrible. You know, you're going to have some of those sellers and you're going to find phenomenal deals. Come on, Zach Nash. Are you kidding me? Listen, guys. Oh God. I love this show so much. I do. I, I, I honestly, I'm going to cry seven deals this month. Deals are out there. That's right. Deals are out there. Stay consistent. Stay consistent. And as we're looking at this, right, as we're looking at this again, if you're just joining, and we'll put all these links here in the comments and the show notes and all that if you're watching this and you're not live. But right here, like, everybody was having fun. Everybody was getting into this market. Everybody was putting out, you know, a lot of content in 2018, 19, when there was, you know, over a million properties, a million two, a million one. Like, people were still doing big deals. People were going bananas. We've got half of that. We've got half the inventory right now. Now, could this go, whoa, crazy? Sure, but let's wait till it happens. And as it does that, as more properties come on the market, we get better discounts with the properties that are off market. I'm telling you. But I just, you know, if you if you look just real quick, one, one more time here. Uh, if you guys look historically at what happens in the summertime, it's it goes like this. And we're about to start the up and down, right? Every time. The only time it didn't was that weird year in 2020 where everybody was locked down. Brent, my biggest holdback <clears throat> is doubt. I'm 18, so I feel that people won't take me seriously. I know what I'm talking about. I just struggle believing that others will take me seriously. Can you help me? Absolutely, Ryan. Listen, squad up. Ryan, you don't have to do this alone. Find somebody that 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 you feel can can be your uh, shield. You know what I mean? Somebody that that can be there and help you out and and go on these appointments. They might not know anything about real estate, but they're like 22 or 25 or whatever. Now, listen. Do I believe that you can go out there at 18 years old and get this locked up and do it with confidence? Absolutely. I, I've interviewed plenty of people your age that have done it. I've interviewed a, a kid that's 14 years old doing it in junior high from his house. He goes over with his dad. They lock up deals. He's making calls. Like, this happens, right? Um, so it's 100% a mental thing. But listen, at 18 years old, there's no way in hell that I would even have the confidence to even post something like this on something like this. You know what I mean? So just, but just because that's where you're at right now, doesn't mean in the next month, 90 days, year, whatever you have supreme confidence, but what helps you out is one, having a shield, having somebody there that, that, that will help you having a good squad of people that will help you. And number two is just take the action. Because what you're doing right now is hallucinating. And we all do it. We all do it. Especially when we're just by ourselves and we have all these dreams and goals and passions and fire. We're like, yes, oh, I want to do this so bad. But, oh, the thought of picking up the phone and calling like some old man or, you know, is, is so scary or somebody yelling at me or talking to some Karen out there that's going to scream at me and tell me I'm the worst person ever, right? And then that's going to affect me for the next week or two. I would totally be scared of that, me, personally. And I had, I had to go and lose everything, and I already had experience in real estate, and it still took some time to get me going and moving. So one, just start taking action and just understand you're human and that, that it makes sense. And you're not going to be able to get through the hallucinations and all of these things and the rejection that you inevitably receive. But if you do it, you're going to get a lot better at it. You know what I mean? You're going to get a lot better at it and a lot better at it and have somebody to support you to go on appointments. Remember, 95% is done on the phone, so they don't even see you. They don't know. I mean, unless your voice hasn't changed yet or whatever else, and you got like a crazy voice, which I doubt that you do. Uh, even if you had a crazy voice, that would be an advantage. People would be like, wow, this is a crazy voice. I'm going to listen to this. So, like, I don't think there's anything stopping you. Just, just call five people today. Just call five people today. That's it. 
I, I know that you have lists. I know that there's ugly properties that you've already found, and you could go to batchskiptracing.com, get the real numbers, or if you want to do it for free, go to True People Search, do that. The numbers are like 50 50. You're taking a shot. And just call them up and ask them and fumble and stumble. Go to ttpinsider.com, get the cold call script, get all the resources and downloads and everything that you need in there because everything you have is in there. It's free. It's, you can download it. You can have access. You can you can get going right now um, and, and just start taking action. Ref. Um, one thing to also understand, too, is that whenever we're calling uh, people, whenever we're on the phone and having these conversations, it's nothing personal, right? There's got to be a, a, a degree of detachment. They don't know you. So if they sound pissed off, if whatever is kind of making you uh, be shy about it is is uh, it's because of that rejection, um, it's nothing against you. They don't know you. They don't know you as a person. It's just a situation for the phone call, right? So you have to detach from those, you know, rejection moments to, to actually capitalize on the good ones right otherwise you can't do it but it's nothing um, nobody knows who you are nobody <laughs> knows you as an individual uh, so just you know take that to the bank right yep. we're just going through the motions at this point so awesome yeah kenny you put this up for something what are we doing here how close are we uh-oh you know sending out some swag oh, sending yeah, out some know. swag everybody knows no we have winners already wait what happened we have 150 what likes already Holy Jama thank you guys. Holy wow. cow. Let's get a hat in here too. Make sure we get a new summer summertime TTP hat. Looks great at the pool. Looks really nice at the pool. Boom. The I'm telling you, ladies, they love it. Uh ladies, the men, they love it if you're wearing it. It's just it's a conversation. Latest piece. fashion yes, statement. It is in just Europe. wow. Alejandra can't not wear it. She loves it. Her boyfriend loves it. Everybody loves it. There you go. Yes. Raf loves it. His kids love it. Goes oh, with come on, shirts. Sergio. Sergio <laughs> Torres just closed a 68K deal last Friday. The sky's falling, guys. There's oh, no yeah. more deals. There's no more big deals. There's no deals out there. The sky's falling. This is the time that those greedy wholesalers are going to really take it. Nice try, <laughs> greedy. I've seen, I've seen like 15 posts. I was like, hey, you greedy wholesalers. Now what are you doing? <laughs> Who's in the driver's seat now, baby? It's like, what? Sergio just closed 68K, bro. Shut it down a little bit, all right? Here we go. Boom. There we go. Uh, you reminded me. Uh, we have a Facebook campaign going on right now, and I got a, I got a, uh, a comment. We got a comment on there, and then you know they were just you know, go back to your own cities and don't buy other houses, yeah. and and you know they were being really aggressive. Yeah. The the person that you were doing right yes. now, like that was exactly the person we had on Facebook. Yeah. And I just, I mean, I, I felt compelled to go in there and then tell him, hey, listen, I mean, there, there's a misunderstanding here. We're not going after the nice properties. We're going after the ugly stuff that people yeah. won't. Move Move into that's yeah. the kind of stuff that gets you the big fat 40,000, 68,000 deals like yep. this. That's it. Um, who, by the way, who so. won? Logan, that was Logan. Logan won. Yeah. Logan's way sending us a, a there he is. There you go. He's gonna pop the top, show show everybody what's up. There you go, Logan. It'll look great with that hair, the long hair, and the he, TTP at the pool. Get out of here. Watch out, ladies. He won. Watch twice. out. The pool's about to turn into a jacuzzi. It's gonna be so hot. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> there we go. I love you, Nathan. There we go. Like Brenton. Brenton's good. I get Brett a lot. Uh, my wife called me Chad for a while. Uh, literally laughing out loud. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Stephanie. Stephanie's on the 75-day challenge. Stephanie, keep calling. Keep going. Keep going. Thank you for posting every single day, keeping yourself accountable. Jose, what lists are good to call at the moment? Guys, I am telling you, I am telling you, telling you, telling you, don't overthink this. They have to be ugly houses. They have to be ugly houses if you want. Now, listen, there's some interesting strategy here. Obviously, I spend a lot of time with Pace Morby and the creative financing, right, and locking up those deals and getting something creative there because you can sell those. If you go back to the cash buyer ladder, let's pop that back up again, um, Aaron, that would be great. 
And uh, when you lock up those creative deals, people will pay you 100% of ARV, even more in some markets, because they can get into these properties for maybe $10,000 down. They pay you $15,000. They're into this property, $25,000. It's got good terms. If it's a sub two or if it's a good creative financing, it's got good terms. They get good cash flow. They're ready to go. And it makes sense to them, right? My, my strategy is not to keep these properties. I only want to keep properties that are in unbelievable school districts in very desirable areas and i want to pay them off as quick as possible it is the i listen follow whatever investing strategy you want to go with whatever feels good in your gut i don't like thinking about things i like doing this i like getting deals and making a ton of money on wholesale and i love spending time with the family and doing stuff like that like i don't want to be worried about business all the time i spent 15 years of my career always having a foggy brain of uh, always thinking about business stuff all the time because I took on too much. The fact when I decided to start saying no to a lot of things is when my that fog lifted. I have a clear mind and I can actually spend quality attention and quality time with my loved ones and the reason that we do all this type of thing, right? You we want the security, but we also want uh, the uh, a free brain to actually experience fully the present moment that we're in, and I think it's important to. Get rid of all of the, you know, all of that turmoil in our head. Stay very laser focused on what we do and find ugly houses, get big checks. All right. So from that perspective, the reason I just ranted that way is I sell any creative finance, any sub two deals that aren't in that box, that tiny box that I want to buy in. I sell all of them. I just get the cash and I'll just sit on it and I'll do something else with it. I'll let my wealth advisors, uh, you know, plan out all that stuff. I don't want to deal with it. I want to deal with raising kids. I want to deal with raising companies. I want to deal with coaching people around the country. I want to deal with this. That's it. That's what makes me happy. That's what gives me energy. And that's what keeps my mind from not being fogged up. So, you know, really look at where you're putting your attention and how many things you're doing attention. I don't, I'm not the guy. There's people out there that can own 10, 15, 20 businesses at a time. I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy. There you go. Uh, so ugly houses, driving for dollars. I love it. Uh, tired multifamily, tired landlords. Uh, I love vacant properties right now are huge. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's the basics. There's no secret list at all. There's no, um, unknown equity list is banging or any of this stuff or, uh, you know, some sort of data scientist list. You know, we spent 30 grand on Audantic and it performs this year. Now Audantic is a, a, uh, um, a list, a, a real estate scientist brain trust, a uh, company that finds what they would consider the most people to sell at a discount. And um, this year it's done as well as our other lists, our world lists. Our world list is like all of our other lists, like squished together. And it's performed just as well as those. So um, don't overthink it. And I think a lot of people are going to find something else to do. I think the people that are going to stay in this business are going to win. I think the people that uh, are going to read into what the future is going to hold and live in the past are going to get out of this. They're going to find something else to do. And there's going to be way more opportunities. You, you know, one thing uh, that I they kind of find uh, happens, it's um, – Usually, when we have when there's a lot of questions about lists, people are using a single uh, just uh, single dialer, yeah, uh, or dialing from the phone. Get a power dialer uh, and, yes. instead of getting too caught up in the lists. Then uh, think volume uh, and get a power a dialer percent. if you're not using uh, that yet, Jose. So just keep that in mind. Yep. Yeah. And remember, you you have to talk to 200 people to get a deal. Yeah. Two. It's it's one deal out of 200 people. He just loves leaving me in the monitor. Yeah, I don't know what he's doing. I'm not even Uh yeah. Matt Matt uh who runs the show that you guys see every week is um uh out with the family this week. So Aaron is doing great. You're doing great. I love that. Look at that TTP, Samuel. Oh my gosh. The uh <laughs> oh, Johnny yeah. Bravo. There we go. Uh I have to talk to a thousand strangers from now until July twentieth. I have seven hundred driving for dollars leads. I'm starting to call today. Should I keep driving to reach a hundred strangers or just pull lists to reach my goal? Well, listen, you're you're really close. Um I think you've got those seven hundred. I would pull a list of three hundred. Just to start testing out. 
You know what I mean? I would just do the tired landlords or vacant properties or any of those. Uh, you might have enough pre-foreclosures in your area that have equity. 90% of them have equity, according to Adam Data, which Adam Data is you know, one of the biggest and, and most used um, for real estate investors. So 90% uh, of equity. So that means we can go after them and they have a timeline that they have to make a decision. Now that it is said that, you know, only one out of 10 of those will actually foreclose, which is great. We don't want anybody to foreclose in their house. It's a nightmare. I've been through it. It stays on your credit forever. It destroys your potential for a lot of different things when you have a foreclosure on your credit. So whatever we can do to help those people, we need to do it. Um, so maybe try those out. But when I look at the whole state of Arizona that has 3 million properties in the state of Arizona, I pulled it yesterday off of Monsoon, which is in our MLS, which is the most accurate data that we can pull, 1,200. Yeah. I'm, I'm on, a, um, on a regular drip for pre-foreclosures. Yep. Uh, three days in a row, we haven't seen any, any uh, new pre-foreclosures uh, come up. Come I'm up, doing so. so that is... Uh, 1,200 to 3 million is 0.0004%. Okay? Right? 6 to 10% is the amount of stressed properties. Now, should you go after pre-foreclosures? Absolutely. Absolutely. I want you to go after those and help those people. Those people need our help for sure. But just don't build your whole strategy on just pre-foreclosures. All right? JC, Brad, can you go into detail about post-possession agreement and how to structure it and add it to your contract? Love it, JC. Boom. Okay, so, Raph, while I'm drawing this thing, will, do you mind explaining what a post-possession is? Uh, post-possession, that's uh, when you're going to leave somebody, you're going to allow somebody to stay in the property after the close of escrow. So post-possession can be given to the seller. Um, if they want to stay in the house, they get paid on the deal at the close of escrow, and then they can stay uh, for an extra 30 days, right? A lot of times it gives them the benefit of having cash in their pockets and not rushing out of the house um, because they need a, uh, to still find a place to live, right? Now, you can do post-possession also on tenants if that's going to help out. Um, you know, somebody that's on a month-to-month -month type of deal, we've done that like for, you know, 15-day period or, or sort of thing. Um, but we, uh, you almost use it as a... As a uh, token right to help your negotiation just kind of go along uh, and a lot of the times it's the one thing that pushes people over the edge and has them sign the contract so it's a good strategy to yeah. use yeah yeah so right here right you have your purchase agreement and then you have your post possession agreement and just google this you can find this you can write it on a word document exactly how you want to do it but typically what i would do is um, if you know that you're going with before you pre-qualified, you've talked to these property owners, they're like, listen, we need the money before we can move. So I need a post possession. I need a couple of weeks after I get the money to, to move into the new place or figure it out or whatever else. Or my tenants, I want to get the money. My tenants need a post possession for a couple of weeks or a month or two months or three months or whatever it is, right? And so you can talk to your title company clo uh, or a closing attorney um, and, and get a post possession agreement that they like using because they're really in control of what happens once this is signed. And typically what this says is there are, they can stay to a certain point. There's going to be $10,000 in escrow until vacancy. I don't know if you can see that very well because of the banana <laughs> thing, <laughs> right? Uh, 10000 held in escrow until vacancy. And just have them put together this, and then you can keep it forever. Don't overthink this. But just make sure that there's money held in escrow that, that is going to tie them to getting out on time. And if they don't, typically uh, you reduce it by $50 to $100 a day that they're, they don't get out. I mean, you could really put their feet to the fly, fire and get, go $1,000 a day, but typically they won't agree to it. But uh, $50 to $100 a day that they lose from this $10,000 Every day over the the agreed on um, vacancy date when they have to actually be out, right? So if it's two weeks or a month or whatever else. Hope that helps. If it if if you need more clarification, let me know, guys. Awesome, JC. There you go. And honestly, just just talk to your title and escrow company and just have see what they have. Uh, for a post-possession agreement, they'll sell it to you, especially the ones that do a lot of wholesale and investment business. Um, Cole, what are some things I have to I I should have in line before virtual wholesaling? Well, you know, here's the thing. Um, 
virtual wholesaling in I, I highly suggest that you go for markets that are a million people plus. 500,000 on the lower end, a million people plus, okay? That's where the most buyers are going to be. And as some buyers exit the areas in some of the smaller rural areas, um, there's just not going to be as many as big of a pool of buyers to sell them to, and then you're going to have to negotiate, and you're going to have to fist fight with your cash buyers all the time. Go to one of the bigger markets where there's going to be multiple offers on your deals. Uh, number two is make sure that you have some sort of boots on the ground. I highly suggest you make a really good, have a really good relationship with a real estate agent in that area. That one will make sure that you don't go over your skis with your comps and really understand the values of those properties. But two, they'll go on the Appointments, get the contract signed for you, represent you. They'll show you the, your cash buyers the deals. Well, why would they do that, Brent? Do I have to pay them a lot? Do they get a slice of the deal? Listen, you're going to run into so many retail listing leads if you're being proactive or if you're marketing. It doesn't matter. You're going to have so many people that want retail that you're going to refer to this person that it's going to be a reciprocal uh, relationship. If not, then pay them uh, per 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 like appointment. I'll pay you fifty bucks appointment, hundred bucks appointment, hundred fifty bucks for the showing. You're gonna have kind of a tiered system. Raf, what do you do? What do you think are the most important for boots on the ground in a virtual uh, wholesaling market? Because you do this. Yeah, we always go straight to uh, newer agents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hit up the brokerages and find out who the new agents are. Uh, they're gonna be super hungry. They're gonna be willing to learn, yep. and they're very coachable too. So. So um, it, it, they're easy to build relationships uh, with. If you go, uh, I mean, what we found is that if we go straight to somebody who's already established, they're not going to want to run around and, and go on, on, on um, um, you know, just like walkthroughs and appointments and that sort of thing. But if it's somebody that's new, they, they're a lot more um, open to that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, definitely. There you go. Definitely. There you go, Cole. I'm really interested on here. If you guys, if you are a full-time real estate agent, I'd be curious. Can you raise your hand on this thing? I'm just curious to know how many people in this are making that transition. Because if you have a loved one that's a real estate agent or you have somebody that's a real estate agent and they are not making a transition right now, they are feeling it. I am telling you, and I'm going to be pushing hard on this because there are great people out there that should understand what wholesaling is, and they're stuck in the realtor, like buyer and seller thing. And just like I showed you right here, can you pull this up one one more time here? There's 516,000 active listings. Half of those are pending, right? There's over 4.1 million realtors. How can there be 4.1 million realtors and half a million listings? That's bananas. If you're a real estate agent, you need to make your pivot. You need to understand what wholesaling is. Not only that, but when I was a real estate agent, I averaged 2.7% on my commissions. Now I average 10%. It's not even close. And I'm my own boss. So if you are a real estate agent and you're like kind of feeling it and you're like, oh my gosh, what's happening? Or maybe you're just exhausted because you've had to work three times as hard to do deals as you have before, or you've had three times the amount of, of, of action and, um, and complaints and conversations and people being mad that they're not getting uh, the properties that they're putting uh, offers on, or, you know, you're fist fighting to, and, and reducing your commissions to get listings. You're in the right place. You're in the right place. Learn this, learn this business. Awesome. W. Sephardicus. Uh, Brent, in this market, I have a great opportunity to put a tear down in a hot market under contract. To make it attractive to a buyer, do I offer the seller the price of the lot and the house? Um, typically, it's going to be the lot. It just depends. Some lots are worth what... Like, for example, here in Phoenix, there's a there's a pocket neighborhood called Arcadia. And in Arcadia, a house will sell, like a really beat up house will sell for 840000 A lot will sell for 800000 right? And they'll just knock it down and, and, uh, and just build a $2 million house on it. So it depends on your price points. It depends on what the highest uh, um, price is that somebody's going to uh, pay for that market. Typically, you want to be around 20%. You want to sell your deal at 20% of what the highest sale is in that market for a teardown. 
Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, you're right on point. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I would probably, you already have the square footage and all that stuff in there. I, I wouldn't see it as a, depending on the, on how hot the, the, the area is, right? But I would even test it out just to, you know, send it, send it out, yep. you know, without considering that it's just the land. Uh, it may yeah. be a teardown to, to you, right? For somebody else, it yep. may be a rehab project. Yep. So you don't know, I would probably just, you know, sell it based on what's there. Uh, and not strip anything off. So look yeah. at what's the highest new build, and then what's the highest remodeled, yeah. and just find comps. And then I would highly suggest you find um, vacant lot comps if you can. Typically, you're going to find those because any new property, I would say, okay, this property was built, and I just do a filter. Built in 2021 or 2022, um, you know, what did they pay for that property? And just look at the look at the uh, transaction history. You could do that in PropStream, uh, TTP in uh, no no TTP data .com. There you go. And you could look at you could look at the the history of of what they bought it for and what they sold it for, and that'll really help you out as well. Good question. Lock that deal up, Isaac. I have eleven lots of land. Wow, that is a lot of L's. 11 lots of land locked up under contract. Brought the price down twice. Contract is signed, and we have a buyer interested. If closed, it's my first deal. Listen, when it's closed, brother, get that deal to the finish line. You need to stay in front of your buyers. You need to make sure that your, your sellers are fine. Trust me, they want to sell those lots. Stay in front of those buyers and make sure, because usually with lots of land, uh, it's a long-term inspection period. So maybe not, maybe it's just a smoking deal and they know the area and they're going to go for it, but uh, make sure that you communicate every single week, maybe a couple times a week, just to see how everything's going. And uh, I'd be curious to know how, how long of an inspection period you had on there or that they wanted, uh, but that's awesome. Congratulations, Isaac. There we go. Isaac out there crushing it. Now, is that a sunset or a sunrise? I think huh? it's a sunset from those 11 lots. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. yeah. It's a sunset to get that deal done. <laughs> I love it. That's good. Uh, Primal. There he is. Uh, best methods in making offers usually. Is throwing in good cop, bad cop usually effective or pull the price out and low ball with comps, et cetera? You always <laughs> want to pull the price out. You always want to pull the price out. We have a ton of videos on here on how to do that. Um, we bring on Ryan Thornton, my acquisition manager. He is a master at it. Um, he's really pulling out price, pulling out price. But you want to get their price first. If not, you're going to have to throw something out there and see what their bottom line is, right? If, if you're pre-qualifying them and they're just like, no, I'm not going to give you my price or I'd be stupid to give you my price or I don't even know the price. Sometimes they genuinely don't know the price. Um, but ask them um, a ton of time. Ask them at least three, four, five, six times what price they want. If they're not budging, then you're going to have to throw out that 60, 45, or 15%. Okay? Uh, Tony Z, Brent, I saw you in Asheville years ago. I allowed temporary defeat to turn into permanent failure. Honestly, I disguise, uh, discussed it with myself. Three to four years of doing nothing. Well, listen, um, don't live in the past, Tony. You got this, man. What can you do today? What can you do today to feel good, right? What can you do today to give yourself a little bit of that dopamine hit from taking action? What can you do today that's going to build your confidence? Text an old lead. Call an old lead. You know what I mean? Uh, go knock on a door of a property. Go uh, call somebody. Just, just call anybody. Just start the action, right? You've got this. Like three or four years, you've you've just you know something's made you pause, um, and so you got to reattach why you want to do this. I mean, obviously, over the last three or four years, I you know I hope you haven't been beating yourself up every day for the last three or four years to not taking action. Maybe you're distracted. Maybe there's something going on in your life that required more attention, which is fine. But now, if this, if you've got time to put attention on this business. Start making calls. Be proactive. You know what to do. You know what to do. Find an ugly house and talk to them. Just start there. Just start. Find somebody that's doing this business, Tony. Find somebody. Go to a meetup group. 
go to a meetup group and and just have a conversation and tell them that you're you're being proactive and if it's somebody big that's doing a bunch of deals great tell them you know what i want to send you as many deals as possible i want to jv with you i just want to make sure that i'm going after the right properties what are you looking for go in and find people that are doing this business just don't do it alone tony don't do it alone. Join us here. Squat up in the comments section. Find somebody local. Find up meetup groups. Find out, you know, uh, uh, have conversations with people. Let everybody know where you're doing business. Um, also, I mean, I'm, just from the context of reading that, it says permanent failure. Uh, there, there is no such thing no. unless we're dead, right? Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, Even then we don't care. Yeah, we're dead. Yeah, we're dead. <laughs> Did you we? know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. So, so one. I mean, one of the things that I, that I would just highlight there is is get that thought um, out of your head, right? There, there's no permanent failure going on if you're still trying, if you're still pushing forward. All you got to do is figure out what's going to work today. What can you do today uh, to you know keep pushing the ball forward? Just to, you know, you don't have to conquer the next year. Just conquer today. Is that think a think Monopoly it. Man Buddha? Yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> where, where is that shirt from? That is wild. Look at that. Crazy, right? There we go. Well, let me see. Yeah, scoot over a little bit. There, there it is. We go. There he is. It's a good balanced dude. Got it. Zen and money. And, yeah. And and house and happiness. And there you go. Big ass mustache. Yeah. <laughs> you can't be unhappy with a mustache no. like that. You just can't. You're not going to grow it. You'll cut it. You won't be confident enough. Sandra, yeah. what do you do if the owner of an ugly house has passed away mm -hmm, and there's no information available online of who the property will go to? Um, True People Finder, right? Um, AmericanTracers.com. Uh, look for people that are related. And what I would do, Sandra, if it's in your local market, I would go talk to the neighbors. Somebody knows what's going on there. Because here's the deal. Like, if they have nobody that was inheriting it or whatever else, somebody was helping out that person, and it's typically somebody in the neighborhood. There's always somebody in the neighborhood. Find out who that was in the neighborhood. Have a conversation with them and see what's going on. Um, we've used uh, Spokio.com too. Spokio. Spokio.com. Sometimes what you'll get there is social media profiles from next of kins and stuff. So yeah. we've found people on the East Coast for properties here in Phoenix. Oh, wow. Um, just because we, I mean, we saw the social profile, went after it, started DMing, and then just reaching out that way. So, yeah, there's a couple of different ways to skin the cat when it, when it comes to finding people. I love it. Yeah. CJ McCoy, Brent, I saw a property yesterday, and it's no way the Zestimate is correct <laughs> considering the sold comps and the property condition. In this instance, how will that Zest formula work? Um, are you saying that it's worth more or it's worth considerably less than the Zestimate? Um, because the Z depending on the price point, we're at 15% to 60%. It should give you enough room in there now if the assessment's totally wrong and, and it's way too high and you understand that then just run it from you know just find out what you think the arv is do a little bit more digging research but also it doesn't matter um really until we know if they want to sell so if you've already talked to them great um, if you, I said, you know, you said you saw a property yesterday. I don't know if you saw it online or if you actually went to the property. If you went to the property, that's incredible. How much do they want? Do they want the Zestimate price? And are you able to explain why the Zestimate price is not really, uh, cause sometimes what happens is one property will be in an area, uh, where there's a ton of new builds. And all the new builds are selling for like six hundred thousand, and all the the older, smaller properties are selling for like three, four hundred thousand. And so the estimates like way too high. That does happen. Um, but you obviously diagnose that CJ. So I think that you should have confidence knowing what the ARV is, and then just working your numbers off of that point eight. Um, just ARV times point eight minus repairs is your wholesale price. If if it's above two hundred, if not, you're you're gonna have to add. Uh, if your property's below two hundred thousand, you're gonna have to add um, thirty thousand. So you're gonna times it by point nine six minus thirty thousand minus the repairs. It's confusing. I'll walk through it. Don't worry about it if you want me to. Uh, De Niro, when calling cash buyers, should I introduce myself as an investor or wholesaler? You're the buyer. Uh, the cash buyers, um, both. You're both. 
So then I find great deals. Sometimes I take them down. Sometimes I send them out. I wholesale them. Do you want to be? You you do you want me to send you the best deals that I can find? You know the deals that that you're looking for. What are you looking for? You know that type of thing. So you can be both. Don't overthink it. I'm an investor. I'm also a wholesaler here. Um, you know, I blast out a lot of opportunities and just want to see if you want me to find you some good deals. Yes. The answer is yes. Uh, Jesus, uh, what can I tell to a homeowner uh, that asked me, if I sell my house, where am I going to live next? What solution can I offer or what strategy can I use there? What are you, what are you saying right now? I mean, I, I we've had this question since the beginning of time. Um but I'm curious to Where, know. I mean, it actually brings me back to that post-possession conversation earlier. I mean, it's I'm, I'm not going to find I'm not going to get in the headache of finding them a property. Um, the uh, but I can, you know, I can tee it up that way. Right. Listen, I mean, we can do a post-possession, maybe give you 30 days after you get paid so you can find a rental property or something like that. But that comes after the, uh, you know, the uh, the close of escrow. Um, I, I don't like to just get into the weeds of finding them a, a, a deal or a property or something that they can swap out because it just, I mean, creates a mess of a, yeah. a logistics. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Zeus, I am telling you, this will change the tra trajectory whew, of your business forever. This single um, fact. A lead is somebody that has made the decision they want to sell their property. They've already made the decision they're going to sign a piece of paper that transfers title from them to somebody else. That is a lead. We're not ever going to convince people. We're not going to ever like, well, if you sell now, you get the most and then you can figure it out wherever you land type of thing. They're like, well, no, I don't want to sell right now. Like they have to have already in their head made the decision that they're going to sell this property. You're not going to convince them. Now, you could shorten the timeline by telling them about market conditions, but if it that seed isn't already planted that they want to sell their property, you're not nothing that you're going to say is going to convince them because we don't go in and go, I'll give you 200% of what it's worth. This is like crazy. I'm going to bring this big check in. It's going to be huge oversized check for double your property's worth. What do you say? It's not what we do. Right? That's not our business. Our business is to find these properties, these ugly properties, and, and get them under contract and sell them. So only work with people that have made the decision that they want to sell. When you get that done, deal finders, not deal creators. It's going to change your whole business because you might think that you have a lead because they're being nice to you and they're telling you that it's run down and they have some things that they da da da, but they're not sure where they're going to go. Um, if they've made the decision that they're going to sell, then dig deeper, right? If they're just like, well, I, I don't know where I'm going to go if I sell this property, right? But if you're like, have you thought about selling? Have you, is it something that you've been uh, considering? Have you been thinking about it? Yeah, we have. It's not really working. The roof's running out. I can't really replace it. You know, you're having those conversations. That's great. They start telling you how bad it is and how rough it is or how bad the neighborhood is or circumstances or emotions they have tied up with this, this property. That's a different story. That's somebody that's considered that that seed is already planted there. Um, and then you can have a conversation while saying, well, if you did sell, where would you go to next? And then that's an open-ended question. And just they, you pull on that string to see, oh, so you could live with family for a little while until you decided where the right place to land would be, right? The right place to, 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 to buy your next place, the next place you want to live. I mean, it kind of gives you the flexibility to have some time to make sure that you get the, the house that you actually want. You know what I mean? Not feel forced to get it if you take some time, live with family or, you know, live on the road. Some people just buy an RV and live on the road or they go and they go, you know what, I'm going to just uh, fi I'll, I'll figure it out. You know, um, that's different. But if they're just like, oh, well, I, don't, I don't know where I would go if I sold this property. Dig a little bit deeper, see if there's motivation there. And if there is now we're talking. But we're deal finders, not deal creators. Right. A lead is somebody that has the seed planted that they're going to sell this property. They're going to, right? It's not going to happen. We're just not in that, well, you know, uh, g give me this big offer and I'll sell. That's, that's not what we do. 
Do investors, I've been sending out mailers and I finally have so many leads this week. Only problem is now I'm nervous as heck to get on the phone. I'm going to push through and TTP. That's right. Get on the phone. Get out there. Have those conversations. What do you, there? listen, they've called you. You sent out mailers. They've called you. Like you had to expect that you're going to have to get on the phone. Now, listen, those aren't necessarily leads. Those are just people that are calling you. That's called response rate. You need to answer those live as much as possible. And you need to have a script. And you need to be going down that script and look at it. You could probably Google the Wholesaling Inc. Uh, phone script or investor phone script. You could get all this stuff online, guys. Just download it for incoming calls, incoming call script, so that you know what you're what what to ask and feel more comfortable with. And just do that. Just don't let it go to voicemail and then you're calling it back and it's this whole thing, right? Make sure that you you try to answer that uh, as quick as possible or call them back within uh, two minutes or less. Do you uh, do you remember when the first uh, time that you thought, holy crap, this is real? Like, do you remember when that happened? Yes. Like, the, how was it for you? Like, life changing. Yeah. <laughs> it broke my brain. Yeah. It was finally, I had finally found it, Raf. You know what I mean? Yeah. I had finally found it. I had read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I had read Think and Grow Rich. I had read the E Myth. I had gone yeah. through the qua uh, Cash Flow Quadrant and all these other things. I had read all these books. I've done all these things. I had, I'd been a real estate agent. And then finally, I can just go and find an ugly house, have a conversation with the property owner, put it on a contract, sell that contract to somebody else and make a fortune? Yeah. Finally! Now I know how I can find deals. It wasn't at foreclosure auctions. It wasn't uh, you know, sending mailers. It wasn't doing all these things. It was just going out and finding ugly houses and trying to get, trying whatever I could to, to talk to the property owner. Yeah. And it broke my brain. And I was like, wait, finally I can work for myself in the real estate business and actually do investor activities. It's yeah. incredible. I'm telling you, this business is the best business ever if you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and you're like, that's the right path. There's plenty of people that read Rich Dad, Poor Dad that get nothing out of it. I'm telling you. But the people that it does, and I'm, I'm sure it's every single person, the 300 people on here, or 250, 260 that are on here now. We got up to over 300 on this show. This is bananas. Yeah. Well, this is absolutely incredible. Thank you guys so much. Um, but um, it finally... Finally, you found because Rich Dad Poor Dad is not the instruction manual. It's education. Yeah. It's not instruction. There's a big difference. There's entertainment, there's education, and there's instruction. And so it was education saying, hey, this is what you need to do if you want to be a rich dad. Yeah. You need to own your own business. You need to be an entrepreneur. You need a business owner. You need to be an investor. You need to do these things. And real estate is incredible. And you're like, ah, yes. It either breaks your brain or you don't do anything. Yeah. It broke my brain and it took me like, I don't know, 10 10 years to figure out and nine years to figure out what wholesaling was. Yeah. <laughs> and now I just can't shut up about Crazy. it. So That's yeah. you, know, you know what I mean? So yeah. uh, Dylan asks, I pulled a list of probates. How do you suggest the opening line should be when calling the personal representative? Same script. Don't change it up. Don't hit him with, uh, I'm so sorry for your loss. Uh, I was calling about a property here. Don't start with that. You know, you're just calling for the owner of the property. Oh, I'm sorry, that person has passed away. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, I'm I'm sorry. I'm not sure if I'm talking to the right person. I'm actually calling about the property located here. I just wanted to see if um, you were you you guys were considering selling that property. I'd love to give you an offer. Understand if right now is not the right time. I want to be really respectful. Um, but you know, uh, we work with a lot of people that have been through this situation, and um, and help to make it as smooth as possible. So that's the that's the energy behind it. Um, but the script is the same TTP script. Yeah, just open it up. They'll tell you. Don't hit them with, oh, you know, I'm calling and I'm so sorry and all these other things. Like, um, it just adds actually some friction. So. Derek. Have you seen issues sending SMS? If so, how have you not been able to be banned? Yeah, we do it all through um, batch leads. And I think that if you stay within the certain guidelines, I think it's like a thousand texts a day. It's pretty strong. But um, the difference between last year and this year at this time, this year, la this time last year, by mid year 2021, we had made like, I think, 300,000 off of text. This year, we've made 30. 
You know what I mean? I mean, we're, we're just crushing it with cold calling, uh, pay-per-click, and referrals. That's that's our uh, that's our four is text, uh, cold calls, uh, pay-per-click, and uh, referrals. And build your referral database up. Guys, don't sleep on that. You need 25 people that are going to send you four deals a year. And typically those are going to be real estate agents or other investors. Um, but, yeah, SMS is tough. I mean, it, it's it, it's the easiest method for them to block you. And that's because people took it. Everybody took advantage of it. Not just our industry, everybody. I think there was like up towards the 12 billion spam text messages a month at the height. Yeah, carriers got real smart. <laughs> They got real smart real quick. Yeah. So they blocked that. They were able to figure that out. Come on, Dimitri. Oh. Dimitri Von Kamp. Van Camp just closed a fifty thousand dollar deal and several others for a total of a hundred and twenty eight thousand dollars in one month. Let's give it up. That's two years salary for the average. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, Dimitri, because the ride is over. Okay? There's no more deals. Everybody. There's a every guy again. I just don't understand. People are on social media, and they're just so, this is what happened to me in 2008. Yeah. I thought the same thing. But guess what? I was so smart then, and I'm so smart now. Okay, great, bro. Like, what are you doing today? What are you doing today? Like, the future is this, and this is what's going to happen. What? Okay. Well, I don't know. The, uh, my crystal ball is broken. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Right? That's the asterisk that everybody puts for these the things that are going to happen in the future. It's whatever. Like, I know. I, cr I got crushed in 2008 because I was over leveraged. I bought bad deals, and uh, I didn't squat up with the right people that were going to protect me. That's the three big things. I'm just telling you. Just don't get over leveraged, uh, find real deals, and squat up with kind, optimistic, strong, proactive people. By the way, I spent only 600 in marketing to get these deals and work alone with no staff or office to pay. Talk Can we put ROI. his last comment on real quick just so that everybody's reminded what a net net 128? Was it 128? Yeah, yeah total. 128,000 from 600. Well, Dimitri, what you need to do right now is obviously you got to hire 17 people to, to scale. Where's all the scaling coaches right now? Oh, yeah. Where's all, where's all the scale yeah. talk right now? Come on. Listen, keep it small. Keep it all. Incredible, Dimitri. Incredible. I love it. Um, I think, uh, listen, that that's it. 600 to 128,000. Awesome. Awesome. In one month. Now, Dimitri, I want you to push it. I want a minimum of half a million dollar in income personally to you this year if you're having months like this. You need to start setting some minimum standards for the amount that you want to make. And remember, guys, this is really, 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 really key here. Okay? And we talk about this a lot. This, I'm going to do it in red because it's not the right way to do it, is income minus expense equals profit no this is how you want to do it Dimitri, Dimitri knows this income minus the profit equals your expenses so the question that us as entrepreneurs have to ask ourselves is how much profit do I want to take the First of all, this business of sourcing discounted properties is a cash machine. This is not a business that you're going to build and sell, okay? Unless you have a weird, not weird, but unless you have a real franchise model for this type of thing, which there's not a lot, and it's very expensive, and it's really a, a huge headache, to be honest, and only a certain you know handful of people get through. The profit that you take home goes to your family, taxes, and assets. These are your sellable. This is your wealth building here. But what number right here is going to keep your attention? Is it 10,000 a month? Is it 20? Is it 50? How much do you want to make on a monthly basis right here? How much? 
Because you figure this thing out that's going to keep your attention, guess what? Shiny object syndrome is gone. Switching tracks is gone. Hiring people before you should is gone. What people tell me in this business is, I'm putting it all, I'm investing it back into my business. It's not going here. Because you're doing this. You're just adding more expenses. And then all of a sudden your profitability is nothing. And then you, you, you have a business that nets you 10 to 15%. When you, could, when you should be 80 to 50% once you get you know, into the millions. What's the profit? What's the monthly profit that you want out of your business? And what are you going to do to do it? And then that lets you stay very disciplined with your expenses. All right? And that's it. Come on up. Congratulations, Demetri. Come on up, team. Come on up, team. Thank you guys so much for joining us. You guys are the absolute best in the business, best in the industry. Support each other. Love each other. Uh, on behalf of Aaron and Raphael and Alejandra and uh, Mystery Kenny and our team mascot, Mac, we want to say thank you for joining us. Couldn't do this show without you guys. It would just be a weird show of me just standing here talking to my friends, and uh, it would be weird. So remember, uh, keep, your, keep your house clean. Like, literally, keep your, keep, clean your house. Keep your house clean and this house. Keep your house clean, especially with what's going on. Uh, protect your health and increase your value to the world, and uh, you're going to live an incredible life. I love you. I'll see you later.